Welcome everyone to today's healthcare teletraining sponsored by a grant from the Commonwealth Fund. I'm Rich Ox. I'm a former healthcare writer from Newsday. And today we're joined by Matt Dempsey, who is the data editor on the investigations team at the Houston Chronicle. At a recent Cebu Healthcare Symposium in Washington, DC, the number one issue the reporters said they needed help with was data. How to find it, how to take care of it, how to interpret it. Uh, Matt is going to lead us through this thicket, which it is in healthcare, as anyone who deals with the subject knows. Um, I just want to, we have a lot to get through, but I just want to let you know that if you have a question, you can send it to Cebu at Cebu.org, and Matt will try to answer it as we go along. Uh, we've also posted an awesome four-page tip sheet that Matt came up with, which I think everyone should staple to their foreheads. Anyway, let's get started, and we'll try to make this as uh, much of a conversation as we can. Um, you know, we'll just play it as it goes. Anyway, take away, Matt. Hi, everybody. So. I just want to make clear before we even get started that, yeah, I'm going to go through like four pages of notes here, but there is no way that this can possibly be comprehensive. There's way more healthcare data than certainly when I started in journalism, what, 13 years ago, 14 years ago, um, it's become like an explosion of data in a lot of ways. There's, it's almost, it's impossible to cover everything in an hour. Um, I could probably, we could, multiple people could probably talk for, day or two alone on just this stuff. So keep that in mind as I'm going through that this isn't going to be everything. Um, this is going to be a lot of things, but not everything. Um, and that I'm going to have, because of how much we're going to cover, I'm just going to kind of breeze through availability and some give some examples of what people have done with it um, in some cases. And then as I go, we'll see how much we cover, but uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, also really quick, uh, this presentation wouldn't be possible without Charlie Ornstein and Ryan Jones over ProPublica's extensive work on this subject. Um, they've written numerous tip sheets, which helped guide this tip sheet, um, introduced me to some data sets that I had completely forgotten about too. So um, just wanted to get that out of the way there. So, so first, let's talk about like the business of healthcare. Um, 990s are the typical way people start because most hospitals are ranged as nonprofits. Um, in quotes, nonprofits, um, but and but 990s are kind of limited. It's a good place to start. It'll get you the names of like the, the their board. It'll get you numbers of, names of their executives. It'll give you some basic financial information, but you won't get a lot of deep detailed numbers. If it gives you top line stuff, it'll give you some basics, but it won't give you everything. Um, what I and a lot of other people like to do is hd ah ahd dot com has free hospital profiles that has, it's a little bit quicker and easier to navigate than 990s. And if you subscribe to their service, which is about $400 a year, which is pricey, but it's worth it if you do this on a regular basis, you get a lot more details. So let me give you a quick look at what this, this is what, this is what the search shows looks like. You'll be able to put in, if you have their CMS number, which is what, how CMS knows, uh, or how you can tell what, CMS has, or sorry, it's their ID number, it's how CMS identifies them. Um, you can pick the city, or you can pick the city, the state, you can give the type of facility, you can get a lot of details on the search. And then the result will be pretty great. Let me type in Houston here and I'll show you one of mine very, very quickly. Um, like, let's see, St. Luke's, since we've been writing about them a lot lately. Um, this is just the free profile version. So you can see really short, like what kind of facility they are, short-term acute care, it's a hospital. It's not a long-term care facility or something like that. Um, it's a voluntary nonprofit. That's how they're controlled. They have 600 and, 678 staff beds. This is how much they make in patient revenue, 3.4 billion. Um, how many discharges a day? How many patient days a day? Their TPS quality score, their patient experience rating. Um, this is just off their free stuff. You can get all this detailed stuff in patient utilization stats from by medical service. So like what kind of care they're providing in the broadest sense of the term, um, who, what zip code, what, where their most of their patients are coming from or their top three patients are coming from by zip code and how much they're charging all sorts of it, the market share part, which is kind of interesting to me, um, outpatient stuff and how, what they're using, what they're using it for. Um, more details on the bed stuff and some, again, really basic um, financial stuff. Um, here's something that you would, this is what it would look like if you paid for their service. You can see a lot more financial detail. 
Um, you get their liabilities, you get their income, how much of it comes from inpatient, outpatient, total, contract, contractual allowances, like the discounts they provide, um, net patient revenue, income, where it's got other in sources of income, where non-patient revenue, uncompensated care, what they call bad debt expense, um, where their money's coming from revenue or from what kind of revenue from Medicaid versus CHIP versus in indigent care on this on the uncompensated care stuff. So lots and lots of detail worth it if you do this on a regular basis, if that's what you're covering on a regular basis. Um, some other, so, so Dallas Morning News has done two good projects based off or at least based in part on that. Um, here, let me shoot. The, they did a project uh, last two years ago about rural hospitals shutting down and they use the AMD data to show which hospitals were having problems. The point of that project was that essentially anybody can own a hospital and there's no real regulations on who can run a hospital and they were basically letting bad people run these things. Um, and Cash for Care is an older project from 2013 about Parkland Hospital, which is one of the biggest hospitals in the country. They did an immense amount of work. It's a really, really great investigation. It's older, but it's worth looking at. Um, they show, they use the AMD data to show that they were bringing in large amounts of revenue, that they had lots of really good financial situation, but they weren't putting it back into quality care despite really bad ratings for quality for a long time. Um, so they had the money to fix it. They chose not to fix it. Um, so transitioning to a different data set, national average data acquisition costs, it's just something that I think a lot of people might not even know exists. The feds or CMS keeps track of the cost of drugs, specific drugs, specific dosage, strength, et cetera. Um, on a, I believe it's a weekly basis, this thing gets updated. So you can track the cost of specific drugs going pretty far back in a pretty granular format. And then if you do what um, WCNC did, uh, which is a TV station, they combine that data with the FDA data on drug manufacturers to show how certain manufacturers were spiking drug prices, some were seeing huge spikes in prices, and then they'd use that data to try to answer why they were seeing spikes. You know, so really cool information when you hear people complain about drug prices. We don't need to tell that story anecdotally. We can tell that story with data. We can be very specific. Imagine doing something like opioids and whether the cost of opioids has gone up or down. Everybody did lots and lots and lots of people did stories about the EpiPen and how much it, the price had gone up or down. That was actually the impetus of this particular project that WCNC did. And they said, look, it's not just EpiPens. Lots of other drugs have gone up and down or gone way up in prices. So. One of the more complicated, but uh, and probably less used sources for medical healthcare or uh, financial data on healthcare facilities, uh, hospitals particularly, is EMA data. So EMA is the um, it's essentially where you can find detail about bonds. Oh, sorry, the drug pricing data. Absolutely, hold on. The drug pricing data you can get that from. Oh, hold on, just a second. Make sure I'm not missing something else. Uh, sure, sure. It's the um, national average drug acquisition cost data. There is a link in the tip sheet, so you guys can have access to it there. Yeah, uh, so a lot of this is on the chip tip sheet, right? So, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. It's on the tip sheet. So the link to the tip sheet, and then I also have links to the um, uh, stories if I have specific stories for specific data sets. So. So Emma, Emma is the place where the Fed, it's like a, it's an unusual. What's Emma stand for? Tell us. Yeah, I, I've got to pull up the specific name for it again. I always forget. Um, it's the municipal market. Um, it's, a, it's basically a municipal securities board. I can't remember what exactly all of it stands for <laughs> off the top of my head, but um, usually people look at it for like government bonds and how governments are doing. And then, um, but a lot of people might not realize that your counties also like work with hospitals so they can, so hospitals can set out like general revenue bonds or bonds for building new hospitals and they can do it through their counties. And because of that, they get access to, you know, all sorts of um, interesting things. And because of that also, they provide tons of information or potentially tons of information to Emma, to the, to their investors essentially. So let me show you um, an example of what I'm talking about here. Um, so I'll start a screen share here. Uh, let me close this for a second, just a second. Quick, 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 quick. All right. So this is what Emma's homepage looks like. Municipal securities and data and documents, right? So if I click on advanced search, Emma. 
Now, if I put in the name of a hospital here under issuer name, I will not get any results, which is super confusing because the hospital is not the issuer of the bond technically. Harris County in Houston is though. So if I do Harris County and I change the sector to health and I don't put anything else in, this should tell me any health bonds that have been issued by Harris County. And it's gonna produce results here, just a second. Now, notice how it says Harris County, Texas cultural ED, blah, 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 all this nonsense in the front. But if you look on the back side, Texas Children's Hospital, Methodist, Memorial Hermann, Memorial Hermann, Memorial Hermann, Memorial Hermann, another Methodist. You know, there's lots and lots, and you can search within this list. So if I want to like look for St. Luke's, uh, which is one of the uh, another one of the big uh, Texas Medical Center hospitals, here are all these separate bonds. When these bonds mature, what the principal amount was for, when it was originally dated, what if they have an S and P rating for that bond, what the S and P rating is, and that's all well and good, and it's useful, it's interesting, right? But if you dig into the specifics, like here, let me find the one I was, sorry, just a second. All right, so here's one for Memorial Hermann after I do a few extra clicks. Notice it says over here, view documents, financial operating filing, filing quarterly report on financial information, 331 20, 2018, posted like a few months ago. The amount of detail you get on this is literally bonker balls. I cannot stress enough. This is the St. Luke's one. Where's the Memorial Herman one? Here. Uh, Memorial Herman. It is a ton of pages with consolidated balance sheets, super specifics. It tells you, I'm, I'm browsing really quick because we don't have a ton of time, but um, it tells you all sorts of like how they came to these accounting purposes, any changes in their policies on how they do the, how do they do their accounting. Um, risk factors show up here. So that's a really good way to determine what the hospital is worried about, which they guarantee you they're not gonna tell you in an interview, right? Um, so all of this stuff is stuff that if I asked it for the, from the hospital directly, the hospital's probably gonna tell me to pound sand, right? They're like, why would I? No, we're not providing that. That's not, that's, that's proprietary information or it's competitive and blah, blah, blah. But look, I mean, this is how much they spend on land a year, how much they spend on building and improvements, building and equipment under capital lease in the thousands. That's $3 billion on buildings. That's fascinating to know about, right? And, it, and their debt, all their long-term debt, where it's it, what is what it's in, what interest rates they're paying, at least in terms of ranges, all sorts of information that they are likely not willing to share on a regular basis. Um, but this is a really, really long document. And if you get down to the bottom, it gives you tons of specifics for a quarter, for a year, how many admissions, patient days, deliveries, inpatient surgeries. So when a hospital, if you can check, right? If a hospital says like they have the most deliveries like baby deliveries, which is a big thing they like to market on, right? You can check to see if that's even accurate. If you can find that data, it might be hanging out in Emma. So admittedly, Emma is tricky to deal with. There's lots of, it's a little obtuse, but if you call Emma, there is a phone number you can reach out, reach out to them on. And there's lots of people there who are willing to walk journalists through how to find the information you want. So if there's a specific hospital you want, you can set up alerts so that it lets you know when a new document has been filed and under Emma for that hospital, et cetera. So it's pretty useful. Um, and I think a, a frequently not used enough data source, probably because people just don't know about it. I didn't even know about it till three or four years ago, so. Um, another data set that is um, financial related is the Dollars for Docs program, uh, a data set that ProPublica has. Now, you can get that data um, from CMS directly, but ProPublica has it in a nice, easy to search format if you're not particularly data analysis savvy. So that's a good place to go. That tells you how much doctors and uh, medical professionals are getting paid by pharmaceutical companies for things like junkets or to promote, the comp promote their drug or things like that. Um, I used that data a number of years ago within, I think, the first year when I was at the Chronicle about four years ago about um, which some doctors that were getting paid quite a bit under that, pro, under, under that data. And then I got to ask them very specific questions about, you know, why is it appropriate for you to get a ton of money from the maker of Botox if you're prescribing Botox, right? Mm -hmm. um, other really, uh, some, one of the more obvious sources is like 10K filings with the SEC. Um, some hospitals will file um, 
10K filings, if they're for profit, um, they'll file stuff with the SEC. You can get executive salaries, tax payments, revenues, lots and lots and lots of data in the SEC filings for on the, the, the 10K filings. Keep in mind to look at footnotes. Footnotes is usually where they bury all the interesting stuff. Um, don't look at just the base data or base document. If it's a footnote, look it up and it might send you into a spiral of looking into, uh, sorry, might send you down the rabbit hole, but it can be worth it if it's something you really want to dig into. And last on the financial stuff, um, every state should have a Department of Insurance or the equivalent of. Um, they're your local regulator for the insurance industry. These departments have things like complaints against insurers, actions taken against insurers, and you'll usually be able to get things like a list of approved insurers and insurance agents. Um, this is what the Texas Department of Insurance looks like. Now, admittedly, Texas Department of Insurance is kind of awful. Um, they're not great um, as sources, but the basic stuff, complaints and things like that, and actions taken, things like that, that's helpful. Um, so you can get access to information like that. So moving on to disciplinary actions and regulators. So this is shorter only because um, some of this is mixed up in the CMS data that I'll go through in a bit, right? But um, I think this is where people will probably start when they start looking for disciplinary actions against medical professionals, uh, which is your state licensing boards, right? So licensing boards, usually, almost every state should, should have a licensing board for their doctors, their nurses, and their pharmacists. So what is available in your state is going to vary depending on the board, depending on your records law, depending on how much they are or aren't willing to share information. But you can get useful things out of them no matter what. So for example, you can check if someone's licensed. Usually most departments, uh, licensing boards have a download so you can get all the licensed physicians in your state or your licensed nurses or your licensed pharmacists. Um, that can be very useful to have as a backgrounding source. Also, it can be useful as a source database if you're trying to find doctors who work at a specific facility or have worked at a specific facility, you can try to see if you can get archive data, but this will help you. You can di dive through and say, okay, I know this person works at this facility. Now, keeping that in mind, sometimes licensing data will say that a doctor works at a facility. What they mean is they have privileges at that facility, not quite the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, so a little tricky on that regard. Um, but it's still helpful for that. If you think that doctor, the idea that most doctors will be licensed, so what's the point? I will point out that um, the most recent project that I just did for the Houston Chronicle, I worked on with the Houston Chronicle, was a project on St. Luke's heart transplant program. And one of the things that we found that we didn't find this through the debt licensing data, we found it through lawsuits and things like that, but we could have is that one of the people that Bud Frazier, who is a luminary in uh, cardiac surgery, um, we found out that his, what he called his right-hand man was an unlicensed doctor. He had never passed his medical boards in the US. Mm -hmm. He was, the lawsuit we found uh, alleged that he was doing medical procedures and seeing patients. And then they were signing Bud Frazier's name off on those reports instead of, uh, instead of the the physician who was not actually a licensed physician. Um, so that was pretty interesting. So just because 99.9% .9 of doctors are probably licensed who are practicing, not all are. Um, so it's a good thing to check, especially when you're doing any kind of like, I would ask, I would check anytime you're quoting a doctor or you're featuring a doctor's name in the story, just check to see that they're actually licensed because the last thing you wanna do is run a story about a doctor saying XYZ as an expert or as um, an example of something and then find out that they are not licensed and you have egg on your face because you didn't uh, do that particular part of homework. Um, other things though you should be able to get, um, broadly disciplinary, any board orders. So disciplinary actions taken in the form of board orders you should be able to get those. And those board orders typically will have all the documents, all the like detailed report accounts of what they did, what the doctor did that was wrong or the nurse or the pharmacist and what the penalty will be according to the board. Um, some medical boards will have complaint data, but not many. Um, 
Some will have violations of licensing rules without disciplinary orders. So they can be found in violation of licensing rules, but then won't be disciplined. I always find that interesting. Some places reveal all that, some places don't. Uh, there's not a ton you can do about it if they are the rec your record law allows them to, unless you get a leaked document or something along those lines. Lawsuits are a good way around that. If you know that a doctor has been misbehaving, but the, light, the medical board's not taking action, which by the way, should be part of your story. If you can find a lawsuit, um, that will help. Um, it might say that the med board did review a case um, and it just didn't um, take an action. So looking at the med board data in, or licensing board data by itself um, can be useful in an individual state, but I think the best example of a use of license board disciplinary orders was the Atlanta Journal Constitution's Doctors and Sex Abuse Project. They used machine learning to scrape the disciplinary or the board actions of every board in the country. I think it was all 50 states. And using that, they signaled out and they pulled out anything that was related to sexual abuse or sexual misconduct. And because of that, they could say some really fascinating and mind blowing things like the number of doctors who had been disciplined for behaving or misbehavior, sexual misbehavior, and then or sexual misconduct, and were still allowed to practice, um, that we're still seeing patients similar to the ones that they had abused, um, including children, including women in vulnerable situations. Um, yeah, pretty crazy. Um, now that took a lot of data work to do, but you could do the local version of that by looking through your own state's data. Um, sorry, my parrot Let is wanting to chime in here. So she's, if you see <laughs> chirping, that's because she's annoyed that I'm not holding her right now. Um, so, shh, hey, hold on just a second. <laughs> She'll actually be quieter if I just grab her. Come on. Sorry. So um, other, other sources. So CMS can um, penalize hospitals if they have readmission rates. If, if they're readmitting, patient, readmitting patients um, for procedures at a rate that's normal than what, they ex what CMS expects normal, they have a me whole methodology for it. Um, they can penalize hospitals by reducing how much they pay providers. So Excuse me, that is, let's see if I can find where, oh, I don't think I have that one queued up, that's fine. Um, so that's another way that C, uh, the Medicare can, or CMS can, the feds can penalize hospitals for quality of care. That's typically where we see most of the penalties from the feds is basically we won't give you as much money or we won't support this program with Medicare. Um, going back to the heart transplant project we just um, have been working, I've just finished not that long ago. Um, Medicare just basically said they're no longer going to accept Medicare patients or me accept Medicare. They're not going to pay St. Luke's for Medicare patients that get heart transplants at St. Luke's. That's a giant blow to that um, program. So the power of the purse is a really particularly strong um, hammer when it comes to attacking agency or hospitals that are misbehaving in some way. So transitioning out so cms data there is so much cms data that it is almost impossible to understate it um, you can get basic cms stats uh, oh actually yeah yeah you can get basic cms stats from let me see let me start sharing do screen shares here All right uh, this is that readmission thing that i was talking about um, the readmission data, um, the reduction program. So you can get a list of hospitals that have had um, had their payments reduced. Now it's going to be listed by their CMS number, not their um, like not their name. So you have to look up what the ID is. So, but you should know. That's one of the things you should know to make it easier to navigate the CMS data broadly. Is if you look at the ID, if you find the IDs for all your hospitals, that will make a big difference. Um, it makes it easier for you to find problems as you're, um, or to identify whether your particular hospital is running into issues. So, but CMS puts out um, every year, usually delayed, a statistical reference book, and it'll tell you all sorts of broad stuff about Medicare um, and Medicare patients and hospitals involved in Medicare and providers. So number enrollees, um, demographics of Medicare enrollees, the Part D enrollment numbers, which was a bigger deal a number of years ago. Um, it's been fairly steady since. Um, Medicare Advantage, cost, pace, demo, prescription drugs used. 
enrollment by region, enrollment by type, um, enrollment by health delivery. It says there's lots of stuff here. Projected population where they think enrollment's going to go for Medicare. Uh, projected life expectancy, life expectancy at birth. So you can see out, like the the most basic version of outcomes. Chip enrollment, uh, which is always a good thing to pay attention to. Um, again, because there's a delay, you kind of have to go back and look at it. Um, but I still think it's worth doing to go back and look at whenever you have issues with chip funding, say, oh, we're not funding chip and X number of people are not getting enrolled or not, not getting services to look at chip enrollment going backwards. So when you know that there was a problem and then you can say there was X number, it allows you to be able to say there was X number of a decrease of X or it dropped by Y or whatever. It lets you be specific. And I think the specifics make a big difference here. Um, for the providers, you can see the number of hospitals involved. So whether you're seeing Medicare, pay, Medicare uh, hospitals leaving Medicare, which is typically unusual, long-term care facilities, which is useful to look at, um, other kinds of providers, types of facilities. Um, and when they mean type of control, they mean voluntary, nonprofit, um, for-profit, things like that. Um, other types of providers that aren't hospitals that provide care via Medicare. Um, expenditures, so how much the program is spending out. This is all just general healthcare statistics by Medicare broadly. Um, how it's used, um, how it's administered, all sorts of, like this is really helpful stuff. It's listed in reference terms. Um, you can just look up the specific tables as you're digging through it. Um, but it, and you can, there's Excel versions of it too. So there's the PDF if you just wanna browse through um, a document and then there's an Excel spreadsheet so you can like, if you're more comfortable that way or you want to move through it quicker, you don't need all the explanations, that's a good place to go to. So, uh, similarly, this is the monster data set, uh, how doctors are paid by Medicare and what they did to get paid. This is going to be for Medicare benefit, for pr services provided to Medicare beneficiaries. So that's only Medicare patients. It's not going to be all patients, but it's going to be what they did, how much they were, you know, what they were paid, where they worked, when it happened, you know, the, the, the procedure code. So what kind of procedure was done? Um, it gives you lots and lots and lots of detail. Um, or that, that, just that stuff alone gives you lots of information. Um, so people have used this particular data set to do a lot of different things. I know we used it for the heart transplant project. Um, to nationalize data that we had at a local level, and I'll get to that local data towards the end, closer towards the end. But at the same time, um, there is, let me see if I can, here. The surgeon scorecard that ProPublica made a number of years ago is a fascinating, fascinating piece of work. <laughs> Um, they took eight elective procedures, surgical procedures, and they took the use, Medi Medicare use data and then evaluated who was doing better by surgeon, not by hospital. Um, so you could rank surgeons by how successful they were at these specific types of procedures, like knee replacements, hip replacements, gallbladder removals, um, spinal surgeries, prostate removals, resections, uh, neck fusions. All of these are um, important, but elective procedures typically. And they worked with medical professionals and experts to create a methodology that was useful for finding out what they wanted or to show what they, to make sure that the rating was valid, right? Got a lot of blowback as one might imagine from surgeons saying it was unfair, but this is one of the first attempts, one of the few attempts I've ever seen by a, hosp of, by a media organization to do risk-adjusted outcome data. And they did that because they had the data from the Medicare stuff. And they have a detailed um, methodology, how they cal calculate com complications and what that meant, et cetera, et cetera. Really fascinating stuff. Amazing work. Um, w from a data perspective, it's like aspirational stuff. Like this is the kind of thing that only you could only do if you wanted to take a really big bite at the apple and try to do something pretty innovative and creative with the data. It also lets you know like literally what's possible with the data we have. Um, something like this would have never been possible 10 years ago. Just not possible. The data wasn't there. So now we can do it and it's pretty great. Um, you can do all sorts of other things with it. You don't have to do something this broad and specific. Um, 
broad and specific. <laughs> it's kind of fun. But um, but you can do look look at for particular types of care or particular types of procedures. You can look for but look at the data by where it happened, like by hospital to try to get some other angles. You can see whether increases or decreases of Medicare um, usage of specific procedures, which is a good way to find out whether people might be bilking Medicare. So if you see that a particular, like essentially code jumping, right? So if you have a if you have a code or a procedure that there's a cheaper way to do it and there's a more expensive way to do it, and the cheaper way to do it is seeing a decrease in Medicare usage, and the more expensive way to do it is seeing an increase, <laughs> that's probably code jumping. Um, some interviews would help find that out. So, but the data would be able to show at least the base land understanding for you to get started, right? Um, similarly, um, uh, I just lost my train of thought. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, I, that's one of the one of the other things outside of just ranking things, right? You can use it that way. Um, and I think there's there's more you can do with this. It's an incredibly deep or incredibly useful data set. It does require some savviness to use. Um, so hold on just a second. You can look at me for just a moment here while I switch over. Um, the prescription data that we were talking about before for dollars for docs, um, that is a CMS data set as well. Like I said, you can get access to, but um, you can also, let me find my prescription part D. You can also look at here. Medicare provider utilization and payment. So this is information on prescription drugs prescribed by individual physicians and other healthcare providers and paid under Medicare Part D. So again, these are Medicare Part D prescriptions. They're not all prescriptions. Um, that's the big, one of the biggest caveats here. But if you think about it, this allows you to be very specific on the types of, it lets you do very, looks for information on very specific kinds of drugs. Like we were talking about on the drug cost thing, this gives you the other half of that equation, right? Not just the drug cost, but how much it's being prescribed, at least, by, at least for Medicare patients. And so because of that, you can do things on specific kinds of opioids. Um, you can look at, in fact, if you look at this, they even highlight their med opioid uh, prescribing mapping tool, um, which is used based off of this data. So it's really cool to be able to be that specific about um, prescriptions um, that have been filed or whatnot, or, or, that are being handed out by doctors. This um, gives you lots of angles. Like remember when we talked about um, EpiPen earlier in the conversation, EpiPens, you can look to see how often they're being prescribed. You can look at, oh, another one is antibiotics, whether there's been an increase of antibiotics being prescribed or not, um, or a certain types of antibiotics being prescribed or not. That's something you can dig out of this data. Again, it's Medicare beneficiaries. It's not all, but it's the providers who are being paid for for the under Medicare, uh, Medicare Part D. So it is still particularly useful. Um, it's Again, one of those things that whenever we have, I feel like a lot of the times when we're working on healthcare projects or something starts trending on healthcare related issues, it is easier for us to do this stuff anecdotally and to find a few patients or find a doctor or an expert or you know at, the, at a local medical school or something like that and say, here it is, if this is or isn't a problem, here's, here, here's why or why isn't something. Um, the data allows us a level of specificity we won't get with that. Um, is it going to take a little longer to deal with? Is it going to be harder to deal with a deadline, especially if you're not as familiar with it? Of course it is. Um, but the stories you're going to get out of it are so much more specific and useful for the reader. Uh, it gets past the, the sound bites and the, the, the quips or the, the things that someone is more willing to talk about and into, spe uh, into specifics that will change how they answer those questions and change how your sources respond to it as well. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so, oop, uh, related, let me show you. Oh, yeah, sorry, there's my parrot. <laughs> parrot let, her name is Taco. Hi, Taco. She likes to hang out. <laughs> I should have moved her into another room, but she's so loud when she chirps, I figured it wouldn't make a difference. <laughs> so, uh, and she does not like being left alone very much. Okay, so let me show you here. 
All right, so here is that opioid mapping tool that they linked to off the opioid page. Mm -hmm. um, it le now it's, again, the opioid crisis is a fast moving thing. So is 2016 data gonna be the most useful version of that? Um, maybe not, right? Um, it'll get you trends from at least two years ago. But it is something, and at least lets you track where it is, you know, lets you see prescribers who are using, who are prescribing it, the rates that they're prescribing it, just lets you see here. Let me go to the mapping tool and see if it works. So Matt, is there is there some place that you could use this as sort of your baseline, but then go for more up to speed data? Just go to the county oh, website? Right, so like or? up to speed data, that's gonna be the tricky part, right? Mm -hmm. um, CMS is gonna be the source for this particular part, right? Right. So. But to it, show if there's like 2016 data, is there an increase, a decrease, you know, whatever. Right. I mean, my suspicion is that there's some states that might have this for Medicaid patients, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not entirely positive as to like where exactly. I know there's been a lot of like um, really good work done on opioids and prescriptions. I know that Mike Stucka at Palm Beach Post has done, done amazing work uh, with the opioid project from a data perspective um, that, so I would like, I would look up Mike's work because the methodology that there might be, they might have shared, I don't remember off the top of my head, they might've shared their methodology data, but I'm not positive. Um, I bet they did knowing Mike, but, um, I saw him speak at an IRE panel last year when they uh, had just finished doing a project on opioid deaths in Florida, um, in their area of Florida. And it was really astounding work. And I know they used other data sets other than the Part D data. Um, so it's worth checking that out. Um, but yeah, at the minimum, this is a good place to start, right? I mean, like to be able to see um, now, this is change in opioid prescribing rate decrease across the board at the state level, right? Um, but extended release opioid prescribing rate is increased almost everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. Little things like this and hot spots where, you know, high rate cluster, low rate cluster, it, it at least gives you some sense, right? It's not going to give you everything. It's not going to get you the whole story. Um, it is out of date. It is up to only 2016, but at least it gets you started, right? Mm -hmm. It's a good place to get going. Mm -hmm. If you're interested, if you haven't covered the opioid stuff yet, um, and you want to get more detail on it, that's a good way to go. So mm -hmm. let me make sure there's no more questions in the queue here. And so um, another data set, um, this is, a, there's a really simple thing is you can get from CMS a list of, in, of doctors by participating insurance network. So that can be a good way to know whether doctors are in or out of net, or in or out of a particular network, like really big size networks. Now it's a little bit of work to use. And I don't have a specific web page to show you. I, I, there's a download uh, link that I included on the um, tip sheet. But at least it's an idea. One of the things that Jenny Deem, um, who's one of our healthcare reporters um, here at Houston, has found is that there's a lot of doctors, particularly emergency room doctors, that aren't, that operate outside of their hospital. So they have their own doctor network that they participate with insurance companies at different rates than that the hospital will. So when you go to an emergency room, you will go to the in-network emergency room and then find out that in fact, all of your care outside of the facility fee is out of network and therefore you'll pay a significantly higher cost for that. How you determine what doctor you will see in an emergency room, I have no earthly clue. Uh, which is kind of the point of the story uh, of, of, her, of her work on that particular issue. But the list of insurers, uh, the list of doctor, list by insurer of doctors participating in each network is a good place to start. Um, it'll give you some ideas. Along the same line of looking at doctor licensing data, if, if someone is telling you that there's a big increase or like a particular network is seeing a decrease in participating doctors or they're having a difficult time getting doctors participating, they don't want to be in network for that um, particular insurer or insurers broadly in your area. That's a good way to check it. You know, you can say, okay, there's, here's how the number of doctors enrolled in or participating in this network has gone up or down over time. Right. And that's more current stuff. That's 2017. So that's last year. Um, 
So another thing, let me show you guys the hospital, nursing home and hospital inspection data. Um, let me do a screen share here. So um, CMS has this five-star rating system, and it's pretty simpler, uh, or pretty, it's, it's simpler than anything else we used to have before they started something like this. But um, it'll tell you their two most recent health inspections. It'll tell you the, um, any complaint inspections. So it's similar kind of to if you're familiar with OSHA data in that regard. It'll give you some inspection data, but if they haven't been there, they won't know. Uh, they won't have it in there. Um, it'll give you some idea and it'll tell you like the outcomes of those inspections, give you staffing numbers and then the quality measures, which are typically, if I remember correctly, um, specific types of procedures that they want common practices of care. And they'll evaluate whether the hospital actually has followed those regulations or not, whether they're actually doing their, um, the, these, whether they're following the measures they're supposed to be following. Um, I think this data can be particularly useful for like nursing homes um, because states inspect nursing homes often as well, but I think the Fed data can be a little bit more interesting. They're coming out from a little far, farther removed. It can be, um, it, it's interesting at the minimum to look through and see what you can find out of it. Um, do also check to see if your state is doing inspections of hospitals and inspections of nursing homes as well, because you can get different kinds of people complain to different places. So if you complain to Medicare, but you also, or you didn't complain to Medicare, you complained to your county or your state, that can produce some records that you didn't, you might not have noticed to see things like that. And also, um, at least in New York, um, I know that the state actually does the CMS inspections yeah. so that's that's also pretty similar um, to OSHA that's the, yeah yeah. Right. Some places, and for OSHA, this is not healthcare related necessarily, but some places for OSHA have their own state OSHA, like Cal OSHA is particularly effective. And other places, it's just federal inspections, like Texas doesn't have a Texas OSHA like that, like Cal OSHA does. Um, they rely on federal inspectors. So your mileage is going to vary depending on the area. But it's at least a good way to get started on a particular, um, the hospital compare and nursing home compare is a good place to get started on the overall quality of a specific place. Now it says quality rating system. I don't think this is comprehensive in any way, shape or form. Your mileage is gonna vary depending on the procedures you're getting, the doctors who are treating you, when you're going, uh, what you're going in for. Uh, so don't forget to keep that in mind, but it's at least a good place, it's a good baseline. Um, so one thing I forgot to bring up when you we were talking about the utilization and payment, um, a story that Wall Street Journal did a story about something, it's just a good, just a good example of something you can do with data. Um, they were doing a, a story about long-term care facilities, like re these rehab facilities that hospitals can send people to um, when they're done with their hospital stay. So they can say they discharged them. So there's no longer responsible for them, so to speak, but they can put them in a long-term rehab care facility. And um, this is what the journal did was they looked at the, what they had heard a rumor about was that these long-term rehab facilities were kicking patients out once they had min maxed out the revenue they were going to get from Medicare. Right? So what they did is they looked at, and they heard it was this particular problem with a particular network. Of, of facilities. So they looked at the, that network of facilities, pulled all their data in, looked at when they were coming in and when they were leave, when patients were coming in and when patients were leaving, and compared that to like when the cutoff date was for the like, we'll pay, Medicare will pay for X number of days, like 15 days or whatever it is. It's probably not that, I'm just pulling a number out of my rear. But point being is they did that, looked at it, and found, yeah, in fact, this was actually happening. There was some discharges up to that point, but once you reach the maximum point that's when the highest number of patients were there and then afterward uh, discharges were the highest number of discharges were on that last day that they'd get paid and then it falls off a cliff um tom mcginty who had done the data work for that project ex was explaining this at a conference and was saying that the um the network's uh, lawyer was really belligerent with them and said that they were gonna sue the journal out of existence and end their careers and all this other stuff saying like, how dare you say that we're doing these things that we're not doing, it's not possible, does not happen, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, Tom very calmly said, let me, let me send you the chart that we're gonna be running with the story. I think that'll make the conversation go a little easier. I think you'll understand more what we're talking about when you see the chart. 
So we sent the chart and it literally looks like this. Here's the chart, you know, like the top part of the chart is like day, 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 and it keeps up, 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 like a, like a, like a reverse uh, ski jump slope, right? And then afterwards it falls straight off. It's like drops dramatically offward afterwards. So uh, lawyer gets the chart, uh, lawyer looks at the chart, lawyer sends a note saying, thank you for your time, really appreciate this chart. Um, I don't think you'll be hearing from us further. <laughs> So went from being ready to sue them out of existence, so to speak, um, and then went to being like, actually the data shows every, you, we couldn't win this case, court case if we tried. So you're safe on that front. So that, that just goes to the point that we're making that data is, you know, as you were saying is, mm -hmm. you know, it's anecdotes are great. You need them to humanize a story, but the data is like the core. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, no, absolutely. And so um, Medicare also has information on overall quality control uh, or quality. If I can pull the site up and it doesn't want to pull up for some reason, otherwise I'd show you guys. Um, here, let me show you this really quick. This is just data.medicare.gov. And I know this is intimidating as I'll get out, but it does give you real quick looks. You can compare physicians. You can see home health data, dialysis, which is, um, I think one of those things is never going to stop being interesting because of the long-term implications of being on dialysis. And so that says a lot about how important it is for people to get quality care because they're going to be the getting care for a long time. Hospice compare, supplier directories, long-term care hospital compare data, inpatient rehab facility comparison data, and tons and tons more. So this is just all the stuff that they at least Medicare um, shares on their data portal. Um, it's particularly useful to dig around. It can be a little confusing to dig around. Um, I would recommend going to Cebu, going to IRE uh, when you're starting on a project, if it's something new and digging around and seeing what other people have done on that subject, seeing what tip sheets are out there outside of what we're talking about today. Because I guarantee you, there's, like I said at the top, there's gonna be stuff I didn't cover and that's not, um, not part of what I've done here, but that doesn't mean it's not out there. I guarantee you it is. So transitioning out, so one of the data sets that state and local data sets, and really what I mean state and local data sets outside of the ones we've already talked about, I mean hospital discharge data. So hospital discharge data is, should be available by every state. It varies widely about whether it's available for free, whether you gotta spend a lot of money, whether you gotta spend a little money. I think it's in, I think the state of Washington, it's free. I think um, in the state of Texas, it's uh, $1,300, $1, or it might be more than that. Um, I think it might be more than that. We went half C's on that, something with someone on it. But, um, and for out of state people, media outlets, it's even more. So the data, I cannot stress enough how useful this data set is, um, particularly if you're in a state where you can get it for free and you can get it going back a number of years, to be able to track specific procedures, specific diagnoses, um, status of patient, like the, you can get all the, di all the things a patient's been diagnosed with in a hospital, all the procedures that were done at a hospital, the status of the patient at discharge, which will tell you whether they died or not it, at hospital, um, whether they were discharged to a long-term care facility, like a rehab facility, which tells you that they were not in great shape when they came out. So especially for, for procedures that that is unexpected, that's a good indication of, um, sorry, uh, complications. Um, where the, so the length of stay, how long they stayed in the hospital, um, when each procedure occurred. So you won't know the dates. We didn't get the date of admittance or date of discharge, but we can tell, they can say that a patient X stayed for 147 days and the heart transplant happened on day 34. And then a balloon got put in on day 45 after the heart transplant or an LVAD got put in on day 67 or whatever it is, right? Which is incredibly useful to try to look for complications. So if somebody was admitted for one thing and then they ended up being having to stay for much longer, something that would have been a day or two hospital stay, but ended up staying much, much longer beyond that, um, this hospital discharge data, the discharge data will show that. Um, it'll also show you how they got paid, whether it's Medicare, whether Medicare, private insurance, private pay, um, no insurance, things like that. It'll tell you how they got their money, if they got their money, um, those kind of things. It's incredibly detailed. It's kind of intimidating to look at at first, and it does take some time to work with. But I cannot stress enough 
um, from a data perspective, how much you can get out of this. Um, it was critical when we were working on this heart transplant project. We knew some information from lawsuits. We knew some information from professionals and what they and tips that we had gotten, uh, and from experts. But to be able to check all those things out with the actual data going back a number of years um, was particularly helpful. It let us see what the mortality in inpatient mortality rate was for the procedures we were looking at. Um, hold on, someone, uh, Dan. Oh, hey, Dan. Um, Dan's uh, pointing out that there is, here, I'll, nope, that's not it. That's not it. Hold on. There we go. Pulling up here. Dan, I don't know about this, so I'm pulling it up right now. Um, HCUP net. So what was he asking? No, he's saying it's not as detailed as what I'm talking about, but free and somewhat national look. Um, and it's all not only, but only at the state level and sometimes county, but it's pulling up. I'm not familiar with the data set um, and it's taking a while to come up here, but it's in the comments. So if you want to take a look at it, um, I trust Dan. Dan's an awesome data guy. So Dan knows what the heck he's talking about. Um, I want to take a look at it too. Oh, here we go. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, qu online query system based on data from the healthcare cost utilization project. So HGP. So yeah, this is, I, I, w I am not as familiar with this, but it's definitely worth digging into um, lots of interesting stuff, I'm sure. Oh yeah, Dad, this is similar to what we're talking about with the hospital discharge data. I can see why Dan pointed it out. So um, let's see, am I not sharing here? Yeah, this is uh, what Dan Bauman was pointing out. Uh, take a look at it. Like I said, I'm not as familiar with it, but that doesn't mean, it, I'm guarantee you it's probably, it's pretty darn useful. Let me find, this is what my Texas inpatient data looks like. So you can get public use, it's called the PDF public use data file. Um, inpatient data file, so not in, it doesn't include any outpatient stuff. So if they're doing outpatient surgeries, you're not gonna get them in here, it's inpatient only. Um, tells you um, how many charges, look at that, like how many charges, the base data, um, the by quarter, it, you have to down the data set is enormous. Just letting you know, this data is huge. You have to download it by quarter. Um, it you can go back a number of you can get broad statistics from them, but if you want to look for the specific detail, you have to buy it. And it's gonna look. This gives you an idea for each. I think this is by quarter. Oh yeah, uh, by calendar year, three thousand a year from 25 to 2015, 2016, 2017. And by quarter, you can pay less. But if you're out of state, it doubles. Yeah. Um, and notice they don't charge, government gets it for free. So, <laughs> but if you think, oh, I'll just ask the government to see if somebody at an agency or an expert can give it to me for free. The list of regulations that you have to fill out, um, this is one of those I'm um, giving my firstborn to be able to get access to the data kind of uh, things. I had to do the same thing for um, when I was in Atlanta and I wanted to get access to something similar um, in Georgia. Uh, I think I was looking for, funny enough, I think I was just looking for birth data, birth names for Georgia specifically. I think that was in there like Medicare birth day, uh, hospital birth data or something like that. But anyway, this is, shows you how detailed it is um, and shows you how much it can cost in some places it would be free in other places. So, um, let me start sharing. And then, so we, like I said, we use this to determine a number of things on the heart transplant stuff. Um, we had heard that there was problems with like, pay, like the number of LVADs being installed, which is a heart assist device was being installed was much higher at St. Luke's than other hospitals. We could check that with the discharge aid. We could see literally how many LVADs have been installed. Um, we could look at the number of you know, one of the things we had heard about was complications. So we tried to figure out on our own, well, how can we determine part of complications? Yeah, sorry. Um, so one of the things that was really um, just thinking about, thinking it through, right? So you had to think about what, what would a complication look like, right? So if your stay is longer, that's a good sign, right? Your, your stay is longer than others. So whether the average length of stay was longer at St. Luke's or others, let's find that out. 
or the number of procedures done, a certain types of procedures we heard from experts, if they did X after they had an LVAD installed or a heart transplant, that would be a sign that something went wrong. Um, did they do why, you know, like they're like, so we could, some of the stuff was, all right, we, some of these things were things we tested for and found out that it wasn't helpful. Some of the things we looked for did show up like, oh, that changes how we looked at it. And that informed the work that the data people at ProPublica were doing with the Medicare data. Um, so they would look at some of the stuff that I was doing on the state end and say, oh, well, we can look at that at the Medicare data. Um, so that was particularly helpful. It's, so detailed and useful to be able to look at that um, from that perspective and get answers to questions you wouldn't even necessarily think was possible to get answers to, right? Um, so the last thing I wanna talk about is the importance of building your own data set if a data set doesn't exist. So my colleague, Jenny, Jenny Deem at the Chronicle and Vox's Sarah Cliff have done extraordinary work on this covering hospital billing by asking readers to send in their bills and then turning those bills into data. Um, particularly on the subject of, the hos of hospital bills to patients, there's no better resource than everyday people. No one gets more bills than your regular, pe regular person. And I challenge anybody, whether you cover healthcare or not, to find a single adult human in the United States that hasn't had some weird billing problem with health medical issues, that hasn't had some sort of complaint, right? And um, I think that it's important to remember that when we're covering these things like quality of care, when we're covering things like how much, how, uh, how successful a hospital is or whether what the revenue is for a hospital or whatnot, that these all involve people, patients and people and our, our, in our system is insane by any measure. And it is people who pay the price for that. Um, it is people who, have to endure that. So everyone has to pay into this insane system. Everyone has a unit. There's a universal story about outrageous amounts we have to pay to get healthcare in the U.S. Um, my kid fell at a scout camp. We were at a scouting scout outing out like two miles south or two hours south of Houston. We were having a good day. It was the last night before we, you know, our last full night there. He was climbing a tree. He fell down. He bunked it. He fell on his face basically after climbing up a tree. He was fine, but the, we had a nurse there uh, who was part of the scout troop, and she said, hey, you know, check him, check him out. He might have a concussion. I think he's fine, but check him out. It's important to do. Absolutely makes sense, right? So we went out. We went down to the hospital, went to an urgent care, not a hospital, because we figured this would be quick. A hospital ER would take much longer. Um, we go in. We see the doctor for maybe five minutes total. They do a CAT scan with a fancy CAT scan machine where he just lays down, takes a quick image, and done. We are, in the hosp we are in the urgent care for maybe 30 minutes at the most, saw the doctor for five minutes, longest thing was waiting, right? We got a bill of at least $2,000 for that visit. I, I'm pretty confident if you combine all the, again, provider, facility, all the you know, four or five, did the radiologist has a separate bill, um, all these different bills, $2,000 for 30 minutes of care. Now, is that reasonable? I have no earthly clue. Is it reasonable? I don't know. But I do know that like, it doesn't seem right. <laughs> and also my wife and I were remarking the entire time we were there that this is a really fancy brand new facility that is, is just enormous. And we were the only patient we saw in that 30 minutes. We they lead us into the back. There are no patients in any other rooms. The nurses, the, the doctors are all kind of just hanging out, doing their thing on a, sun a Saturday afternoon um, in a pretty populous suburban area and there's nobody there. You know that facility costs a bunch of money to make. You know that, that MRI or that CAT scan machine that we utilized cost a bunch of money for the hospital. So all of those things are built into the cost of the bill we get at the end. And that's really what impacts people the most is how much my pain or whether you're allowed to get care because of that. Um, so I just wanna double down on the fact that Jenny and Sarah have both done really great work on this area focusing on patients, focusing on people and what the financial impact of it is and taking it outside the realm of a politics discussion and having it more be about the impact on people. And people are wanting to share this information. They want to tell you about it. Um, they want to waive their HIPAA rights to be able to talk about how this ridiculous bill I got from Hospital X, right? 
So building that data out, asking your readers to provide something, doing a little digging on your own and getting that first story done and then seeing, watching the influx of people's stories come in is pretty remarkable and helpful. So that's not the only area you can build your own data sets in. There's all sorts of things, but don't forget that your, your readers all have to interface with the system and they all have stories to tell. And maybe you don't have the time to tell everybody's stories, right? But you do have the ability to do a call out and ask to see if people are willing to share specific documented information like bills, like um, diagnoses, if they have that in a document that they can share or things like that. And they might be willing to share that. And if you get enough of people, you might find stories you didn't even know existed. Because I know Jenny has definitely found that. She d does one little thing or opens the door open a little and if it's like opening the flood floodgates, it's enormous the amount of feedback you get. So. Um, but that is um, a very quick dive through all of this. Um, so let me ask you a question. If there, say you're, we'll work at this like in the simple. So say you, you're given a quick daily mm -hmm. and you don't really cover healthcare that much, but it, you know, it includes a hospital or a doctor or a nursing home. Where do you go as you were talking about to sort of do baseline Mm -hmm. checks to make sure the doctor has a license or mm -hmm. the hospital isn't in arrears or right so if you're you covering just cover if yourself about, that way yeah. no absolutely absolutely it's kind of like your basic set of things for backgrounding so if you're going to background a reporter if you're going to background a doctor if you're quoting a doctor do a quick background check do a do a doctor's license check to make sure they don't have any disciplinary orders against them check dollars for docs to see if they're getting paid um, by the company, by you know, in relation to like the thing they're talking about to you, or just in general, check it out. Um, those are things that have easy to use interfaces that you can look at really quick. If you're writing about a hospital, look at the AHD free hospital profile. That's a very quick look that you can do. And say, okay, here's this. Um, if you're covering, if it's broader than that, um, it's probably not a daily, right? Mm -hmm. um, if it's broader, so if you're new to the beat, build it out that way. Um, build it out by looking at, building out the data sets that you think are the most useful. You know what I mean? So that, that are useful to you. So start with the stuff that you would be doing on a backgrounding perspective, right? right? And then you say, okay, I need to know this stuff first. And then from there you go, okay, what's the next impos most important thing I wanna know? Well, I wanna know about the quality care data, the, the quality ratings. Do any of the hospitals in my area have a bad rating for that, right? Um, I know that a hospital has a specific specialty. I want to look at that, right? Uh, I, so I want to look at the Medicare usage data to see whether um, they're getting more or less patients for that going up or down. If there's, your hospital has had layoffs, maybe you look at the EMA data to see what their bond data has. So your mileage is going to vary depending on what you're looking at. But for the basic checks, you know, things like ProPublica's dollars for docs, looking at the HD hospital profile, looking at di licensing data, um, is a good place to start. And don't forget lawsuits. People sue um, on medical stuff, and that's how you can get a lot of this information from documents filed in court. Um, They're also a good way to get patients. I mean, if you're looking yeah, for absolutely. real people, that's well, often a good place. Yeah, talk to Yeah, them. if you're not willing to, if you can't put a call out because you don't want to reveal your, your what angle you're working on, that's a good place to start too, yeah. is to look at, uh, at you look at, pro, um, sorry, not Edgar, um, like PACER, sorry, PACER yeah, and then your state yeah. files, your district, your local district courts uh, for civil filings and things like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank uh, the Commonwealth Fund for paying for all this so that you guys can be, so it can be free for you guys. So no one has to pay to register for it. Um, um, I was happy to participate. Um, the healthcare stuff is fascinating to me and um, it's not something I cover all the time. But it's one of those things as, as you dig into it um, from a data perspective, it's incredibly fascinating. The wealth of information available to you is staggering and means you can do so many stories you wouldn't have thought possible before. So. Right. And I want to thank Matt for an amazing presentation, a lot of information. I'm so glad we had the tip sheet so we can go back and look at it again. And I'm sure if you have, if there are people that have specific questions, you probably be happy to email mm -hmm, that. Absolutely. Um, you, know? you can reach me um, at, or at Mizzou Sundevil uh, on Twitter. You can email me at Mizzou Sundevil at gmail.com. That's my personal email, not my work email. That way, um, I don't know, 
some people get weird by email and people don't work. But my Mizzou Sound Devil thing is I, I check that thing everywhere. Um, I usually don't check my work email on weekends because I try to have a work-life balance. <laughs> but um, and a parrot. <laughs> yeah, and, and parrotlet. You know, I, tacos as I. So, um, but yeah, I'm happy to answer questions. Um, honestly, you might people like Dan. Uh, I guarantee you, there's stuff that people know about that I haven't thought of or forgot about. Yeah. So there. I mean, um, anything. Uh, you know, any other, yeah, I guess IRE is a good source. Mm -hmm. is a good source. IRE is a great source. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm a board member for IRE, so I really uh, recommend looking at the tip sheets and whatnot for yeah. IRE. I think it's uh, incredibly helpful. <laughs> uh, and then, um, but yeah, I mean, the, there's go to conferences. Um, AHCJ, um, the Amer Association of Healthcare Journalists, AHCJ, is um, yeah, that's right. It's fantastic. They do a conference every year. If you're doing um, healthcare journalism, um, you're covering healthcare in any way, that's a good place to go to. And also, Cebu. Yeah, Cebu. Uh, going to Cebu, uh, uh, and actually, Jenny came to our symposium. She was great. So that's right. And Jenny's great. Uh, yeah. What's the email? What, we said yes, thank you. What's the email? Can we see it here? Oh, let me type it in the chat here. That's fine. Um, and I'll change it to everybody, all panelists. Um, you can, my, my DMs are open. So if you guys want to, I'm not quite so, I'm not so f popular enough that I need to restrict my DMs. So if people uh, want to ask me a specific question on, on Twitter or Gmail, either is fine by me. So. Okay. Well, thank you again. Thank you, everybody. Uh, where was the tip sheets? Tip sheets on Cebu, on the Cebu.org website. Uh, here, I'll, I'll link. Yep. Crystal got it. Thank you, Crystal. Yeah. So. All right, everybody. Yes, if you're on the main site, um, <clears throat> you'll see a, uh, a carousel slide that's going to go through, and it says the, the dig deep into um, healthcare data. Click on that, and partway down the page, you're going to see the link to the tip sheet. All right. All right. Well, thank you again, everybody. Thank you. But, so thank you for having me, and thank you for everybody for hanging in there through the whole thing. Um, I know it was kind of lengthy, and but I think uh, we covered a lot. So oh, we did. Good. We covered an amazing amount. Thank you again, Matt. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Bye, Bye everybody. <laughs>